You may know them for their wood glues, but did you know Titebond also has a complete selection of construction adhesives? Designed for a variety of applications, Titebond's adhesives make any building or home improvement project a breeze with their high-performing and durable formulas. These adhesives are trusted by the professional, providing squeak-free subfloor installations, long-lasting retaining walls, and even fastener-free feature walls. Check out Tightbond's construction adhesives at tightbond.com, including their newest award-winning adhesive, Tight Grab Plus. Oh boy, we were talking ahead of the show, and uh, Adam from uh, Chittenango has been listening to the show for the long time, and he wrote in with a question. He says, hello, FHB podcast. To prove that we are completely crazy, my wife and I purchased a cabin in the Adirondack Mountains with a collapsing foundation. By collapsing, I mean the CMU walls are hinged into the basement in such a way that the entire wall might drop at any time. One wall has hinged to the point that the concrete block in the corner have crumbled into gravel and have fallen into the basement. We had a local contractor put in temporary cribbing in the basement so that if a wall does give way, the cabin won't fall into the basement hole. Assuming the cabin is still standing come next summer, we plan on replacing the foundation one section at a time. It's on a hill, so we should be able to put in a footing drain that's able to go to daylight with a less than a 20-foot trench from the cabin. Our preferred replacement foundation would be a permanent wood foundation, assuming that there is a concrete footing under the block wall. Our plan would be just to build the new PWF between the footing and the existing cabin. So here comes the questions. Is there any problem with using a permanent wood foundation in glacial till soil that clearly puts pressure on the foundation? Will the footing drain be enough to reduce the soil pressure? What would be the best way to seal the new permanent wood foundation to the hopefully existing irregular footing? My best idea so far is to put a strip of bituminous membrane down on the footing that is wider than the bottom plate will be, then put two thick beads of acoustic sealant or big stretch caulk between the membrane and the bottom plate. The membrane would block water from rising through the concrete into the permanent wood foundation and the sealant should fill any voice caused by the irregularity of the concrete footing. The membrane could also be a clean waterproof surface to tape other barriers to, hopefully creating a dry basement. Finally, what is the best way to waterproof this permanent wood foundation? I believe the layer should be the, ply, the plywood foundation, plywood waterproof layer, dimple mat, rock wool comfort board, clear draining gravel, and geotextile. The rock wool gives some insulation, but more importantly, protects the dimple mat and the waterproofing from gravel during backfill. The dimple mat and gravel allow drainage to the footing, so hopefully relieving the pressure that crushed the first foundation we're dealing with now. The geotextile is to keep the gravel from getting clogged over time. I don't have a clue what waterproofing layers are appropriate for a permanent wood foundation. Finally, can a PWF support a Bilco style door? Since a PWF gets its lateral strength from the foundation below and the floor joists above, can one be used for a Bilco door installation where there are no ceiling joists attached to the top? Finally, this is the really finally, 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 is our entire plan, plan insane? Are there any of our assumptions that are just plain wrong? Thanks. Adam from Chittenango. He says, P.S. The next set of questions for the Fine Air Sling podcast will be about the best way to fix the leaking roof. Okay. Wow. So, Travis, uh, would you be tempted to buy the uh, cabin that Adam bought? Can you give folks a, a synopsis of what it looks like? Well, I will definitely uh, sign on for charming structures. Charming structures <laughs> are always charming. And when you drive by them on the road and you go, oh, look at that cute little cabin. What a wonderful life we could have there. And you have visions of homesteading and reconnecting with nature and being close to the people that you care about. It's a really romantic ideal. And then you go inside of the cabin and you see what you're left with and you go, boy, this is a lot of work. Maybe I could just visit someone else's Airbnb cabin uh, <laughs> because the amount of work that Adam is facing is tremendous. I, uh, <laughs> I live in a home with a CMU uh, basement wall. And most of the homes in my market that were built between the 1950s and the 1970s have that same condition of CMU foundation wall. And almost everyone that I've been in has had some measure of structural repair done because we're in an area with expansive soils as well. So as the fatty clays take on moisture, they expand, they push in the walls. And while you have the support at the floor slab laterally and the support at the rim joist where your floor diaphragm is to resist that lateral pressure, that mid span, there's just no resistance. And so they all bow and break in. 
So in our market, because we have these nice uh, concrete slabs in the basement, you just cut in a little pocket, drill down a little bit, put in a pier, and basically a, a small either U-channel or concrete, excuse me, or a metal post, uh, either a four by four or six by six, depending on the height of the wall. Um, but essentially a, a steel, uh, a piece of Column. structural steel. Yes. Uh, and these are common here. In fact, people here just refer it to, oh, I've had my basement peered already. And they're, yeah, the pier is down low, but the, the metal beam, excuse me, the metal column rather, uh, that runs up the wall and then into the floor diaphragm to support it both top and bottom is what's resisting that lateral pressure. And they're about at every eight foot interval. That's common here. And while I don't know uh, as much about the soil conditions up north where they are, I would suspect that that's the type of repair that it would take to save this foundation. His idea to replace it with a permanent wood foundation, I think, has merit. Um, and there is a really great guide on permanent wood foundations available. The American Wood Council makes all those specs readily available online. So you definitely do it. But if I'm not mistaken, my recollection is that the secret to those working really well is a massive relief area on the outside of crushed stone that will handle all that water and pressure. I think he's going to be excavating out at least four to six feet on the exterior side of the entire perimeter. It's a huge amount of work to do that. I'm not sure that that's what I would do to solve it, but it is a charming cabin. And I'm sure that if anyone can fix it, uh, Adam <laughs> from Chittenango, uh, with the guidance of Randy Williams, uh, can't miss. <laughs> Randy, what would you do with this building? Um, I think I would try to stick with a, a, a non, um, wood foundation, go to a poured wall. Is it because or, of the reason Travis identified with the soil pressure? If that's the case in that, that area, yes. Um, and I do have some personal experience, um, with, uh, wood foundations. Um, this back before I became a contractor, I, uh, it was my own personal house. And it was a cabin. Um, we were, we had bought it. We were looking to add a basement. We had a young family. We wanted to uh, put a basement underneath it. So we lifted the cabin up and we were planning to dig underneath it. And we did not realize that we had a really high water table in the location that we were at. And we dropped that cabin four feet to the ground <laughs> while we were trying to work on it. I, luckily, it was overnight. Nobody was there. Um, it, was, it didn't. I mean, it, there was some damage, but it wasn't substantial. It was stuff that we were able to fix. We jacked it back up, um, actually did a wood foundation alongside the cabin, and then rolled the, the, the cabin onto the foundation is what we did. Um, the biggest difference we with that, with, I mean, this was a new foundation. We weren't trying to tie to old footings. Um, and I know we, we had probably a foot of crushed rock underneath our our foundation to control the, the high water table um, and the water management underneath. And we had a sump that of course everything went into and we were able to control water in that area um, to, to, to make sure that we were staying dry unless there was a power outage. We did have a couple of instances back in, this was back in the early nineties where we had a, a power outage where that water level came up in the basement and we had a flood we had to take care of. So the, there's some things with, with, wood foundations that uh, they're, they're a little more challenging, um, but they are carpenter friendly, especially if you're not used to working with. And into, uh, you know, Adam's particular case, it's something you could do incrementally, right? It's something you could uh, on the weekends do a section of, of a foundation or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be challenging to get continuity of water control to do it a piece at a time. Like the, the troubles in our work is always at the joints, right? So the more, the more things you can do as one continuous piece or have both sides of the corner exposed at the same time. Um, it, it definitely could be done. And I, I agree that uh, that is an advantage of it. It is certainly carpenter friendly. Uh, it's just the, uh, I'm not sure the juice is worth the squeeze for <laughs> me. Adam, Adam's a pretty ambitious listener though. I think this could happen. Uh, am I crazy to think that this is like an ideal scenario for ICFs? Uh, you know, uh, Adam stacks them up on his footing and then has a pumper truck come or a mixer and uh, fills them up. Is that crazy? I, that's what I would do. 
that's what you would do. Mm -hmm. What do you think, Travis? Well, I have limited experience with ICF, only on habitat. Well, me too, houses, but that's so, not going to prevent me from suggesting it. <laughs> <laughs> I assume that you were on board just because you would need to get an excavator out there at some point, and I know how much you love to get an excavator, so I, I figured you were on board already. Uh, no, I think that the ICF could be a, a good solution. I would probably, if I was going to go that route, I would look to like perfect block because they're they're bigger modules. You know, they're they're generally four foot long. Uh, and I think either 10 or 12 inches tall. So you would be able to move much faster. Uh, and I think it might be a small enough footprint. I'm assuming it's somewhat remote because it's a cabin. If you can't get a pump truck out there, uh, if he's going to self-perform this, uh, you guys have seen the mud mixer. I think it was even featured in a, um, a recent issue. I don't know how recent it is. I'm always behind. Uh, but it's basically a, a, a constant concrete mixing tool um, that can, I want to say you can go through about 80 bags, uh, in a four hour session, which is a pallet. Uh, so you can move a lot of concrete with this very small device, provided you have water. That would be my approach to it. Um, just because I've done enough research on the perfect block stuff that I know, uh, with confidence in the pest resistance. Uh, we have termites in our area and the, the issues that would with be less of a worry in the Adirondacks, I'm guessing. Uh, Depending where, yeah, I mean, because it can often be very cold. Just to, if you're gonna, if you're gonna do a, a, a some kind of a concrete where you're pouring it yourself, just make sure you get the the, the building high enough off the out of the way, because um, reaching in there and trying to get the concrete in, to the, you gotta, you know, normally you have nothing ahead, above you and you can work. When it's that tight, I've got some experience where it it's not fun. It could be, yeah, especially if you're getting dragging cupfuls your arm. of concrete and pouring it in the top of the cavity. Yeah, yeah that's that's, awesome, that's pretty yeah. slow. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've got a tip for that. Uh, we had to do a repair recently. Uh, I'll submit it. That'll be a tease for a future episode. But basically, you know those uh, those plastic dust pans that snap onto five gallon buckets. Yeah. You've seen those. Yeah. We uh, we had to do a rim joist repair and a foundation that had to be grouted in. And we made that our transfer because oh, the cool. wide nature of that dustpan already on a five gallon, it made it really easy to transfer. But that's that's for tips and tricks. I'll send that out to you. Well, folks, you heard it here first, though. I tell you, that's a good reason to listen to the podcast with regularity because you're going to get trips from Travis. I think that's a freaking new new uh, idea for the podcast. You can turn those in anytime, brother. <laughs>